Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. So I've had this idea for this video. It's actually not an idea for this video. I've talked about this particular subject for years and years. And it's what I call the Y2K curse. Now, for those of you that don't know what Y2K is, Y2K is the year 2000. When the year 2000 was coming up, a lot of people thought that computers were all gonna freak out and they thought there was just gonna be this big global meltdown of computers that of course never, never eventually happened. But there's something that did happen in the music business. And there were bands that were huge bands in the 90s that just did nothing after the year 2000. I first started thinking about this because of the Foo Fighters. Now, Foo Fighters were a band that didn't fall victim to the Y2K curse. They were one of the bands that was famous. Dave Grohl put out his first record in the mid-90s, and they're still famous. They're still putting out records. They're a band that actually got over the year 2000. But a perfect example of a band that got caught up in the Y2K curse is the band Live. Now, those of you that know Live, you know the record Throwing Copper, for example, that had huge songs, right? Like Lightning Crashes on it. As the 90s progressed, live just basically disappeared. Once 2000 happened, who, who knows what happened to live? But I started thinking about this. There's a bunch of bands that never made it really past 2000. Yeah, some, a lot of them did release records after 2000, but they really essentially disappeared as a commercial force. And there's reasons why, which we'll talk about, but I'm going to start naming some of the bands. Everclear, Sugar Ray, Cake, Dishwalla, Tonic, Bush, really, for the most part. They were, nothing happened after 2000 with them. And yeah, they stayed together, but really nothing. Toad the Wet Sprocket, Alanis Morissette, Paula Cole. I mean, honestly, Counting Crows, great band. I love Counting Crows, but what happened with them after? Goo Goo Dolls, Big Head Todd and the Monsters, Blur, Rancid, Dada, Gin Blossoms, Mighty Mighty Boston's, Collective Soul, and I love Collective Soul, Blues Traveler, Sister Hazel, 311, Our Lady Peace, Bare Naked Ladies, Toadies, Helmet, Days of the New. Take a band like The Verve, A Storm in Heaven, which came out in 1993, or Urban Hymns, which came out in 97. Think about songs like Lucky Man or Bittersweet Symphony, or If the Drugs Don't Work, or Sonnet, that were all on the Urban Hymns record. It's an amazing record. And then just gone. These are bands that, most of which, had all their fame in the 90s and just literally disappeared off the scene. Now, let me give you an example of bands that didn't. Bands that actually didn't succumb to the Y2K curse. Like I said, Foo Fighters, Korn. These are bands that were big in the 90s, and stayed big. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blink-182, Green Day, Radiohead, Tool, Weezer, Incubus, Creed. These are bands that were big, some of which were big in the early 90s, many of which were big in the late 90s, and equally big after the year 2000. So what happened to these bands that had the Y2K curse? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with the change in radio formats. In my video last week, I talked about the fall that rocked the world, and it was about the fall of 91, really the, the beginning of alternative radio, when grunge and nirvana really blew up. Well, something happened in the mid-90s, and that was the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that was signed into law by Bill Clinton. And what that did was it consolidated a lot of the American media. For example, in 1983, 90% of American media companies, you know, publishing companies, television companies, print media, were owned by 50 companies. By 2011, 90% were owned by six companies. Those six companies in 2011, GE, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, CBS. So what did this do? It consolidated playlists where just a few people were the gatekeepers to all these different radio formats. What that meant was a homogenized radio format where they were playing all the same stuff. Because of that and new metal. 
became the dominant force in alternative radio. In the mid-90s, there was also the Lilith Fair artists. Lilith Fair was actually a festival put on by Sarah McLaughlin, I believe. It was a festival of female artists, which featured Sarah McLaughlin, Cheryl Crow, Tracy Chapman, Jewel, Paula Cole, Suzanne Vega, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Fiona Apple, Joan Osborne, the Cardigans, just many, many, Lisa Loeb, many female artists that were all huge in the mid-90s. And then bands like Hootie and the Blowfish, that didn't make it past there. Now, Darius Rucker went on to become a famous country star, but Hootie was left back in the 90s. So what happened to alternative radio that that changed this? Well, alternative radio, if you start thinking back to the late 90s, bands like Creed, Linkin Park, Limp Bizkit, Kid Rock, these are bands that were starting to get big in the late 90s and became massively big in the early 2000s. There were a few different radio formats that were going on at the time, right? Because we had alternative radio happening in the 90s, but then you had the split off. In Atlanta, for example, we had 99X, which was alternative, and then leaned towards active rock. But actually, in the very late 90s, they were playing stuff that would eventually become AAA. Uh, Sarah McLaughlin, they played Sean Mullins, they broke a lot of people's records, and then they started becoming a heavier station. Then you had Project 96, which was really an active rock station, and then you had Dave FM, which was the AAA. AAA was the catch-all for John Mayer and Howie Day and, and things like that, that after 2000, that became the dominant radio format of things that were not heavy music, the kind of anti-active rock bands. It's really an interesting phenomenon. You know, what about bands like Third Eye Blind? Their first record was massive. Came out in 1997, right? Had five singles on it. Second record had really one big hit on it. 1999, I believe it came out. So grunge infiltrated alternative radio, right? You think, you know, Pearl Jam, Chili Peppers, Soundgarden, Stone Temple Pilots. And then by the mid-90s, alternative radio became mellow. A lot more mellow. If you think of Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, and then 94, 95, you're getting Dave Matthews and Hootie and the Blowfish. I mean, that's a pretty radical change. And then that split happened with the really heavy music that happened right around. I mean, honestly, active rock became really big around 97, even though Korn was around since the early 90s, but the active rock radio format started to become really big, probably around 97 or so. A lot of these bands, the Sugar Rays of the world, the Smash Mouths, they just did not fit. Cake, their music just did not fit in this new musical universe here of new metal. There was nothing about that. You know, when you think about people playing their guitars tuned way down to A, playing seven strings, there's something about the culture that people wanted to move away to a more aggressive style of music than the mid-90s alternative. Just, you know, it's just something that happened for a period of time. It's just one of those things. It's just the same as why grunge, people wanted to get away from the hair metal, which became kind of cheesy, at, in the late 80s, early 90s. And the grunge bands were heavy, but were much more serious in tone and in vibe. So the Y2K curse was a real thing. It's kind of a thing I invented, but at the time I realized what was going on. I, I thought to myself, man, those bands just can't, they just have no relevance right now. And I think one of the things was that I was producing beginning full-time in 1999, and the bands that I produced were active rock bands, for the most part. I did do some alternative bands. I did some AAA bands, singer-songwriters and things like that, but 80% of the groups that I produced were heavy bands like Korn. <laughs> Actually, not Korn, but they were like Korn. They wish they were like Korn. I wish they were like Korn, but they weren't. Uh, but I produced some some cool projects, and 
it was a really interesting time to be a producer. I was fascinated with the production of that kind of music, especially when you had heavy guitars, you had DJs, you had all these different things that you really hadn't quite had in rock before, the low tune guitars. It was uh, it was very fun and something that I enjoyed immensely. That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're a first time viewer, ring the bell. That'll let you know when I go live and when a new video comes out. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment. That's very important. If you're interested in the Beato book, go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. Follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1. Check out the new Beato ear training program at beatoeartraining.com. And if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks for watching.